Okay, we're back, we're live. Who's in charge, the military or the civilians? What's going on here in this democracy? And for this discussion, we have my brother, Gene Fidel, knows a lot about the military. Uh, we have Brenner Fassell, who teaches at Hofstra, New York. We have Carl Baker, uh, who has spent a lot of time on foreign policy at the, um, at the Pacific Forum and CSIS. And uh, we're gonna talk about how the United States handles itself and should handle itself on the, um, what do you call it, the ranking, can I use that term, of the military and the civilian people who are running the government or running the military. And uh, I will say that I, I told my brother about this, I wanna offer this as a thought, um, that in Sudan, they made an agreement because they couldn't agree on anything between military and civilian. And they agreed that every 21 months it would rotate. And so the military uh, uh, crowd, the junta, I suppose, um, <clears throat> would be in charge for 21 months, and then it would turn over to the civilian government and they would be in charge for the next 21 months. This has all the badges of failure uh, and it's already failing. Um, but the example is good because it shows you there is an issue there. And in some places, um, you know, the military somehow gets in charge. And maybe that's a possibility here in these United States. So Gene, who's in charge and what's the best way under our democratic constitution? Exactly. Thank you. <laughs> well, the, the answer of course is that Congress is in charge. R really, if you uh, read the constitution, which everybody should do every once in a while, uh, Congress uh, appears in article one. That's not an accident. That that came first. It, it's a, I, I suppose, a, uh, a an inheritance from Britain, where Parliament is supreme. Uh, so Congress is supreme, subject, of course, to uh, powers that have been given to the executive branch in Article Two and and to the judicial branch in Article Three. And Congress, uh, under the Constitution, has a variety of powers that do relate uh, quite directly to national defense. Uh, the power to make rules for the government and regulation of the land and naval forces, power to deal with captures at land and, on land and sea, uh, a variety of pow uh, the uh, power to uh, establish a navy, for example. Uh, so, you know, there's a clear textual basis for uh, Congress uh, being in the driver's seat. On the other hand, you get to Article Two if you're still reading, uh, and lo and behold, the president is the commander in chief. Well, what does it mean? Uh, if you're the commander in chief, if Congress has told you to do something, don't you have to do it? And the answer is yes, basically that's right. Uh, either as a, an enforceable matter or, uh, you know, as a legal matter or uh, through the power of the purse. If, you know, no money can be withdrawn from the treasury without an appropriation. And if Congress decides through the power of the purse that it's going to zero out some military program, it is zeroed out, you know, subject to occasional spats such as can the president recycle money or reprogram money from one program to another such as the wall. Uh, so that's a beginning uh, to an answer to your question, Jay. I know there's more to it. So, um, you know, Carl, we have had a number of, uh, what do you call it, military engagements in our lifetimes and very few of them have actually had congressional imprimatur. Uh, our commander in chief decides one day, uh, you know, we're gonna go in and we, I'm gonna take my troops with me and we're gonna have a military engagement someplace in the world. And arguably that's not constitutional, but it's happening, it's happened. Where do we stand on that? Who's in charge? Well, I mean, clearly, I mean, the, the, the simple answer is, is that, yeah, Congress is in charge, but we really need to figure out of what they're in charge of, which is the, the broad question. And, and how, do we, how do we make them accountable? You know, and I think the real problem for the military is how do you make the military accountable for all these actions that have been done with the military saying, we got it, we got it, just give me a couple million dollars more money and a little, uh, a few, few thousand troops and I'll take care of it. You know, and, and I think that's where the problem lies is really about the accountability. The, the answers are fairly simple. It's a, we're in democracy, so we wanna have some kind of democratic system for controlling defense and security policy. But beyond that, it becomes very complicated because you're, you're basically giving the military the authority to execute force, but you don't really give them 
more guide, if you don't give them more guidelines than that, then they're going to take it and run as far as they can, as fast as they can, until somebody tells them to stop. And that would be? Well, <laughs> I mean, it could be policymakers in the executive, or it should be the legislative branch, as, as Gene has said. You know, uh, Brenner, could it be that- what it's, what it's not going to be, if I can offer a friendly amendment, Carl, or if, <laughs> no, uh, it, it's not going to be the federal courts. This, this is basically an area where the federal courts are yeah. very loath to get involved. Yeah, yeah. And, and maybe that's, you know, that's uh, related to my next question to, to Brenner, because we live in times that move quickly. You know, and on December 7th, uh, FDR could go to Congress and get a declaration of war in a matter of hours. Um, I'm not so sure that anybody could go to Congress now under really any circumstances and get any action within a matter of hours, you know, uh, bipartisan, you know, almost, I think it was almost unanimous. So how does time enter into this? We have these actions, uh, I don't want to call them police actions, but call them military engagements hither and yon, uh, where the president dispatches troops. Um, could an argument be made, and how good is the argument, that, that we have to move quickly sometimes as the world's, arguably the world's policeman. Nobody likes that term either. Well, Jay, I mean, we, we've sort of shifted the question that we're asking now because you, you're saying the president is engaging in these He's ordering these troops to do this. Well, the president's a civilian, right? So we do have civilian control of the military, even if it is executive civilian control of the military. Gene is saying we need executive, or sorry, civilian legislative control. But I mean, the, the primary guarantor of the civilian control is that the president is the commander in chief. So Article Two is doing that work, Gene, in a way uh, of civilian control. And I, and then if we segue this with Carl's point, the question then becomes, is the military ever acting without any presidential uh, in, uh, authorization? Then we would have a real true civilian control problem. And maybe, Jay, can you imagine a situation where the military would need to act without consulting the Secretary of Defense or um, the president? And maybe there would need to be standing orders, or maybe it would be an emergency. I don't know. But that would be certainly the most problematic case, right? Mm -hmm. That's, I, I cannot that's, imagine the situation, but Gene, you had a point on this. Yeah, let's 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 complicate it a little bit more. I, I want to toss some more complications into this stew. Um, suppose uh, the uh, the military, uh, you know, part of the civilian control of the military is uh, the who's the Secretary of Defense. Well, so now we have for the second time in a row and the third time in history, a retired general as the Secretary of Defense. Well, you know, I have nothing against General Austin. He seems to have been an excellent officer. Um, but, you know, he spent 30 plus years in uniform. Uh, is he, should Congress have given him a waiver? That's what it took. There is actually a statute that provides a cooling off period of, I think, seven years before uh, a, a retiree can become Secretary of Defense. Should they have done that? Should they have done it for his predecessor, General Mattis, another distinguished officer? Should they have done it for George Marshall? So that's, uh, that's one thing. And, uh, you know, it, it, what, what does civilian control mean if the, the ostensible civilian, you know, if you take off the Brooks Brothers suit, no offense, Brenner. Uh, you know, turns out to be turns out to be wearing a, a camouflage, uh, you know, uh, uh, underwear. Uh, you know, uh, and and uh, as far as the the hill is concerned, and here's here I really want to complicate things. What does it mean that we have increasing numbers of uh, either reservists or former military people in the House and Senate? I mean. Hardly a day goes by without my getting a call or a fundraising email from somebody who's running for the House or Senate. That's that's fine. That's democracy. I'm for that. Uh, but you know, right up in the first sentence or two of the pitch is, "I served in the Navy, and therefore I'm qualified to be a member of the House of Representatives." I mean, is there is there too much of a good thing? Is that a good thing? And is there such a thing as too much of a good as a, of a good thing? Well, that, you know, that goes to an, a, a question that uh, has been a pet peeve of mine 
since uh, the 70s. And that is, uh, so we now have a volunteer military, pretty much. And we've had it for a long time. And, um, you know, there was, there was one thing, you know, the greatest generation, a lot of those guys were reservists, even in Vietnam. A lot of those guys were reservists. Uh, Carl, how does, how does that change things? If you have this kind of clubby thing where everybody is a volunteer uh, and everybody is in this um, special commitment club uh, for, uh, for a career, not a two-year stint or a four-year stint, but a career. Does that change things about who's running what? Well, of course it does. And, and I mean, to, to expand on Gene's point, it's not only in, the, in this Congress that we're seeing this, but we're seeing it in the policy positions in the Pentagon, where it goes beyond just the secretary. It goes beyond his, his role as, as the interface with the executive branch, because now you've got policy people in the Pentagon who typically have military expertise, which gets translated into they've been in the military. And so now you, you no longer really have this, this artifact, artifice of, of civilian control in defense policy. You really have a bunch of, of lower ranking people who are working in defense policy who used to be military and now put on the Brooks Brothers suit and call themselves civilians. So yeah, you have this, this clubby atmosphere. You don't, you don't get people from Yale and Harvard joining the military anymore. You end up with, with a, a different group of people, and they tend to be fairly conservative, and they tend to be from rural areas and smaller universities, because those are the ones who are attracted to, to the military, because the, 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 the wealthy East Coast folks aren't interested in being part of the military anymore. Note, note the slur. <laughs> and that you, really covered, you covered a lot of bases there, Carl. You, get, you picked off the East Coast, which is anything east of the Mississippi, I imagine, and the entire uh, Ivy League. So, you know, uh, but yeah, I know. But, but, but let's keep talking. <laughs> yeah, no, let's keep slurring. Uh, so, Brenner, you know, uh, we had, we had the most remarkable president the last time around. And he threw a lot of money at the military at the beginning there. And he said, I, they, they owe me because I gave them a lot of money. And then he took the money back for the wall. I mean, the whole thing, he was playing with the military budget and trying to ingratiate himself somehow and being you know, the personal leader of the military. Um, how did Trump change things on this particular issue? Um, did, he, did he change the way it worked the relationship with the president between the president and and the joint chiefs and the military in general not change but certainly rejected the the norm uh of of uh, against a caesar like cult of personality um which we've which is really historic in this country is we do we do like ex generals as presidents our first president was george washington but george washington was also celebrated for not uh not not sort of continuing in power as a general after the Revolutionary War ended. And so, in fact, there's a big building in DC, you might have uh, driven by a gene, the Society of the Cincinnati, that he was equated with Cincinnatus, the Roman general who laid down his, his arms after the war and, and did not become the king. So Trump is basically the opposite of that, is that the cult of the personality and the closeness to the military is was part of his image and that's i think we can all agree that that is not an ideal norm for a, a democratic society all right i have a point of trump mr chairman you mean uh, your pot <laughs> a pot this is a privileged motion in the student senate at queen's college this was a privileged motion a point Thank of you. trump we so, get to the point please <laughs> I recently read this anecdote about our uh, immediate past president. He attended a, uh, a, uh, a school, a military high school, military prep school called the New York Military Academy. Uh, and um, there came a time when he had to have his photograph taken for, I guess, the yearbook or something when he was going to graduate. And, and the photograph you know, exists, the, the yearbook exists and the photograph is there. And it's a photograph of a uh, cadet or whatever they call them, Trump, uh, you know, in a, a, a uniform with a lot of decorations and the stripes, the chevrons that you get if you're like a battalion officer or something. 
Come to find out, and this is the point of Trump, it wasn't his uniform. It was another cadet's uniform that he had borrowed <laughs> for, the, for the purpose of having his photograph taken. Now that's definitely a point of Trump. Yeah. Okay. We we return you now to your regular broadcast. <laughs> but let's talk about let's talk about a current event and and the uses and misuses of congressional authority. And let's talk about the case of Lieutenant Colonel Stuart Scheller of the Marine Corps. Yes. Uh, uh, Brenner is deeply involved in military justice. Uh, he clerked at the Court of Appeals for the Armed Forces and uh, is the uh, in charge of the country's leading um, military justice blog called CAFLOG. Brenner, do you wanna open that up? Uh, well, I mean, I will raise something that I don't think a lot of people outside of the military justice community know, which is that at Scheller's uh, sentencing, um, a ca uh, character witnesses were called, and one of them was Marjorie Taylor Greene. And presumably, we, we haven't been able to actually get the transcript of what happened, but presumably Marjorie Taylor Greene was going to back up Scheller's criticism of the Afghan withdrawal. This is really kind of problematic. Um, and she's a sitting member of Congress, and now she's testifying at a criminal trial talking about political matters. So the, I'll put this one under abuses, Gene. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I have seen a news report that says that the military judge silenced her you just cut off the microphone on her because she was just wandering into politics. There was another witness from Congress, a gentleman named Louis Gomer, a Republican of Texas, who uh, oddly has a law degree uh, 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 and um, uh, has already made an indelible mark on American politics. Uh, so he was he was another person that testified. In addition, uh, when uh, Colonel Scheller was in the brig at uh, uh, Camp Lejeune, uh, the um, uh, a number of uh, Republican members of Congress signed a letter uh, to the Secretary of Defense and Secretary of the Navy, I believe, demanding that Colonel Scheller be released from pretrial confinement. So there you have members of Congress dealing with retail administration of justice. You know, nothing, uh, correspondence like that would never happen to a person who'd been put in pretrial confinement by a federal district judge, for example, in the Article Three courts, uh, so you know there's a certain there's a certain wackiness to uh, Congress's uh, vision, understanding of its own role with respect to uh, military personnel matters. They they will you know they treat this as sort of casework. Well, it's a constituent, or maybe it's not a constituent, but it's it's some. Um, individual GI, I'll just write a letter to the Secretary of the Navy. And this is crazy. It's very disturbing. And the whole Scheller case is very disturbing. Um, oh, you know, just, first of all, it, it, it emanated originally from Twitter, I think. So here's a Lieutenant Colonel, a Marine, no less, who goes on Twitter, criticizes the Joint Chiefs and the Secretary of Defense and the President about a policy decision. How dare he do that? This is the Marine Corps. They don't do that in the Marine Corps. And then you find that it's been politicized. It's been politicized by further uh, social media, by others who happen to agree with them, who are in the service, all of whom may be in violation of the UCMJ. And it's been politicized by members, as you say, Gene, of, of being in Congress. This is very disturbing. And it shows a, a, a lack of discipline, a lack of um, good conduct in the service. Uh, a deterioration, if you will. Carl, do you agree? Uh, wh where do you come out on that? Well, I, I, let, let's go back to where we started with you saying that you know things have changed, time moves fast, information isn't as isn't as as uh, founded in fact as it was before. Go back to the late 1990s when there was a young major marine named H.R. McMaster who wrote a book about dereliction of duty. Now, granted, this was 20 years later, but it was about the dereliction of duty by the military of the Vietnam War, but he was he did his he did his fact checks. He did it was very thorough, and wrote a scholarly book about dereliction of duty. Now we get to Shaler, and we get the same thing, but we get it via Twitter, and we get it via via snippets, and there's no coherence. And I think that that sort of summarizes what's happening with 
with the the old ideas of civil military relations is it's it's just all scattershot there's nobody that really thinks through what we're trying to do with this this triangle between the people the the government the congress and the executive branch and the military it's 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 everybody out for themselves and everything gets politicized in the process and it's all done you know via social media yeah, I, I think Carl's absolutely right. And I, I think also you can't talk about um, the uh, pathology of the uh, congressional military relationship right now without talking about the internal pathology of the Congress of the United States. I mean, let me give you an example. There's a young man, a uh, graduate of a leading Eastern law school, make a note of that, Carl. Uh, named Josh Hawley. He's a member of the world's greatest deliberative body, the United Audley, States. Senate. Audley has a uh, law degree. Has a law degree from a very fine law school. And uh, uh, Mr. Hawley, Senator Hawley, uh, reportedly uh, has uh, put a stop on all nominations to uh, positions in the Department of Defense. You know, he's like, he, he is to Defense Department nominations as Senator Ted Cruz, another graduate of a leading Eastern law school, different law school, uh, is to the Department of State. He's put a hold on all ambassadorial nominations. I mean, so there is some real pathology internal to the uh, to Congress that plays out in truly uh, uh, devastating and um, uh, scary ways. When you're talking about national defense, or the you know the the the, the Department of State that is the you know the the peaceable <laughs> the peaceable uh, partner of the Defense Department, so uh, you know I, you can't. In other words, you can't isolate out one particular kind of pathology from the rest of the the uh, the organic whole of the federal government. Yeah, and it it it, it hampers. Uh the government, you know, from doing anything, Department of Defense, <laughs> Department of State, they're hampered by not having their, um, uh, you know, uh, nominations con confirmed. Uh, so, uh, Brenner, I want to ask you a sort of a military question. If you have um, people like Scheller uh, and others who join him, who, uh, you know, who also write Twitter and Facebook messages agreeing with him, um, and criticizing, you know, the government all the way up to the top, or the military chain of command up to the top. Uh, is that is that um, something we can afford to have? It's it seems to me it's a violation of good order and discipline, but it's it's widespread in a way. Um, and can can we operate an effective military with this kind of free for all? It's a tough balancing act, I think, Jay, because you don't want to have automatons who turn their brains off and stop thinking about what they're doing. You don't want to ha have that. We, the most, all the atrocities in, in the world have been committed by people like that who haven't been thinking about what's right and wrong. So you don't want you don't want them to turn off their brains. At the same time, it's not really the thinking that's the problem, is it, Jay? It's the communication and the publicization. And so <clears throat> I think Carl's right that we're in a new world with social media that you wouldn't have had to deal with this 20 years ago. You wouldn't have like chain letters that would be as, uh, there's just not the opportunity to publicize. So it's a it's a new world that they have to confront. And I think you'd agree, Gene, they're still uh, walking in the dark, feeling their way through at this point. Yeah, Gene, I wanna go back to a, a comment you made uh, earlier. And that is, um, so we have a relatively new president and uh, let's assume that uh, Joe Biden doesn't know a whole lot about military affairs, strategies, whatnot. Um, now he's faced with a, with a bunch of guys, including some generals who were appointed uh, to high positions by Trump and stayed with it, like Milley. Um, and then we get into uh, you know, his decisions. And there were a number of decisions about Afghanistan. Um, and those decisions, some of them you know, arguably were really, really wrong. Decisions about you know how to ramp up to the departure, the departure itself. I suppose you could put that on the table. Um, how to how to deal with um, you know some of the facts coming out. <clears throat> the uh, for example the um, the uh, drone killing of of the the wrong person and all that. 
Um, and so here is the president, commander in chief, he has control, but you know what? It's, it's just like the earlier thing we talked about. Um, he, he's, he's got to deal with the club and, and the club knows a lot more about this than he does. And he may be in a, in a position where he can't really argue that much with them. If they tell him, um, you know, hey, no problem about getting out. We can wait till the last minute before we uh, arrange transportation uh, for the uh, uh, Afghans that, um, you know, are in harm's way. Um, and so uh, I, I, would see, I would see him as being subjected to expertise, perhaps, that he couldn't argue with, but he had to abide by. And he adopted that expertise as commander in chief, and he made some mistakes. What, you know, looking at the crucible of those decisions and the way they emanated and, and were carried out, um, what do you think about that? Was that good process or not? Who is that addressed to? You. Ah. Well, uh, I'll, I'll quarrel with uh, your premise, Jay. Uh, I, I don't think there's ever been a president who has, from the standpoint of uh, you know military matters, had better preparation, uh, with the possible exception of President Eisenhower. Uh, and I say that because here you have uh, a president who served eight years as vice president. <laughs> and uh, in that, and he was an active vice president, he wasn't a figurehead, he wasn't, you know, just another pretty face. Uh, so he, and he had a good relationship, I believe with President Obama. Uh, and before that he'd been a, a, a senator since he was like 30 years old or something. So, you know, he, he's been around power for a very, very long time. Okay, just remember he was hampered in the transition, right? Intentionally. Yes, yes, and that's yeah, that's a point of Trump. Fair, that's a fair point. Uh, but but you know that, for one thing, the minute it became obvious that uh, uh, the uh, outgoing administration, it did go out, by the way, in case anybody is listening, make these former President Trump. Um, you know, it, it became obvious pretty soon that the uh, Trump administration was going to gum up the transition and basically dock the incoming administration a couple of months, uh, which is what happened. On the other hand, you, you know, the uh, the Biden transition team was a phenomenally powerful team. I mean, they were really uh, the the uh, as good as it gets in terms of the skill sets. The National Security Advisor. Jake Sullivan, you know, widely admired uh, a, a, a very long uh, period of preparation, uh, very uh, shrewd and uh, uh, experienced. So, uh, I, 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 I'm just, I think there's a there's a flawed premise or a questionable premise at, at least. Okay, um, well, let's just uh, then try to answer the bottom line question: Was a good process? Um. No, I, I would say not. Uh, I, I, but but it was but the flaws in the process had been baked in for twenty years. I I think the uh, administrations, uh, one after another, uh, were far too dependent uh, on information flow from the Pentagon, and far too uncritical of it, and unwilling to. Uh, make the kinds of uh, political decisions that uh, they could have been making uh, and display greater skepticism than they should have displayed. Now, that's 2020 hindsight. I get that. Uh, but that's, that's my hindsight. That's, what I, that's how I understand the, the sequence of events. But I want to talk about one thing while we're talking about process. I think there's some real problems. And getting back to your original framing for our conversation today, some real process problems in terms of how Congress goes about its work. Now, uh, Congress passes, with respect to national defense, Congress passes enormous pieces of legislation, hundreds and hundreds of pages of legislation. Um, and much of that is arrived at behind closed doors. Uh, in the military justice area, for example, uh, meaningful hearings are as rare as hen's teeth. Uh, and that I think is uh, quite unfortunate. A lot of the hardest decisions are made uh, in conference committees or they're made uh, in markups 
that the public is not uh, around for. Now, here, here's, here's some realities. And I speak as a person who wasn't a political science major uh, in college, but you know, you pick things up over the years. L look what you have in the uh, sort of uh, pantheon uh, or constellation of forces dealing with military legislation. You have contractors, government contractors. Uh, there are billions at stake in, you know, th that are the stakes of uh, defense legislation. Uh, contractors have checkbooks, contractors give to campaigns, contractors will buy a table at the, uh, the banquet, and so on and so forth. Um, veterans organizations have real power. They may not have the, the big bucks, but they have real power because they have voters. Uh, the one group that is not in the mix is GIs. W why is that? because Congress in its infinite wisdom has outlawed the creation of unions. So the, 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 the workforce is tongue-tied on this in, this, in this part of the legislative forest. Carl, you know, we've, uh, we've you know, been playing with a, a few notions here. Um, you know, one is that Congress has really not a, done a good job. The second is that and I'll, and I'll throw this in if anybody wants to disagree with me, say so. There's a, a huge number of people in the, in the armed forces that are resistant to the vaccine order, which, uh, which I find uh, quite extraordinary and political. And we, I think we've established that uh, the military has, been, has gone conservative. And in some cases, they've gone political. And people in Congress have you know, enhanced that. And so you have, um, uh, where a situation a few years ago, you would never think that the military was political, really. I mean, we have one, um, uh, one of our hosts who's a three-star retired Air Force uh, who always says, I'm not political. I was never political. It's not in my nature to be political. I'm not going to be political. But I think the military is getting political. Uh, and the, my question to you is, uh, should we be concerned that the military is no longer, you know, um, an instrument of the commander in chief, no longer an instrument of Congress, as we have seen Congress doing the leadership, the national leadership on this. Should we be concerned that the military is like um, um, becoming a, a wild card in terms of the uh, relationship on ruling on governing the country? Well, sure. I mean, just just as we, we should be concerned about what's happening with the presidency, with the Congress, certainly with the military as well. I mean, I think, you know, there it's, it's, it's a reflection of society. Military reflects society. And, and clearly, you know, the, despite my, my unintended slur about the East Coast, uh, you know, the, the fact is, is that the military does recruit from, from rural areas, which are largely uh, Republican these days, and and they carry a lot of those ideas on when they join the military. So yeah, we should be concerned about it. But it's a it's a broader it's broader than just the military. The military, as I say, reflects society, and it reflects what's happening with the other branches or the other elements of this of this triangle that we we're dealing with with civil mill relations. And so yeah, we should be concerned. Should we be concerned that if the military takes greater power, so to speak, uh, somehow it you know it all evolves into greater power vis-a-vis -vis the what do you call it, the civilian establishment, namely the commander in chief? Um, that would be a concern for the country. Uh, that it won't it, be not taking, only would, Jay, it won't be taking power. That's not in the military DNA. It will accept it if it's yielded by other branches of the government. Fair enough. Yeah. Nature abhors a vacuum. Yes, fair enough. So, Carl, um, you know, the, the balance could change here. We could find the military taking more and more, I'm going to say, leadership in military matters vis a vis the civilian part of the government. Well, uh, I mean, would you be concerned about that? I mean, clearly, in the transition from, from the previous administration to the Biden administration, there was a lot of concern about that, of how, how one side or the other is going to use the military to ensure the transition. 
And I think, you know, with what I see happening between now and 2024, it's going to become even a bigger concern because I think, I think the 2024 election is, is setting up to be a, a very, very problematic event. And, and the military, as it becomes politicized, is, is going to have that problem. I mean, I don't recall ever seeing a, a chairman of the Joint Chiefs as political as Milley has become. Whether, and it's not really his, his doing as much as it is him being put in a circumstance where he's forced to be political. And, and, and in some respects, he was duped into some of that. But the fact is, is that yes, the military is, as Gene points out, can get thrust into that position. And I don't think the military is very well prepared for that because as you say, your, your three-star general who says he's not political and has no tendencies to, that's been, that's been beaten into every military officer. But the fact is, is that the retired military officer community is becoming much more active and, and it's going to force the military into positions where they're going to be put in a very uncomfortable position, I think. Yeah, and so many, so many uh, senior officers retired are, are coming on the media, welcomed on the media for their opinion, where they opine on what the government is doing with the military. That's so troubling to me. So, yeah. Brenner, I, I saved the most difficult question for you. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you've heard all these concerns expressed, and it does seem that there's an issue here. And uh, the issue has all the possibility of whether... Um, you know, Biden stays in office, Trump comes back, whatever it is in, in, the, in the dynamic of the country, that this issue is going to remain and probably exacerbate. And so my question is to you, what do we do about it? Uh, what does Congress do about it? Could the courts get involved? Uh, although they're not involved in, you know, as Gene said right now. And, and what does the president do in order to establish or reestablish the notion that he is the commander in chief? He will make the decisions and they will not, uh, and he will speak to the country and they will not. Hey, unfortunately, I think we'll have to hit rock bottom and there will have to be a social movement. So this, this is what happened with police um, a year ago, uh, a year and a half ago. Many of the criticisms of the military that are, uh, my, my two colleagues here are noting have also been leveled against the police and uh, that they're skewing partisan, they're resisting civilian control, um, et cetera. And uh, the police have been able, and also um, they, uh, Gene, they've been able to unionize and use unions right. to Correct. protect themselves. Um, it, but it, it, for decades, they uh, were politically active. Uh, basically, you could not speak against the police and win in many local elections. Um, you would seek out their endorsement. And they operated with impunity for decades. And that has certainly changed some things technical, right? Technological, I guess, was the advent of cell phones, but also a social movement. Uh, what you might think of rock bottom when we've had a number of killings that were recorded uh, that were unjustified. So maybe we need to have that rock bottom moment um, in order for us to people to wake up and reassert their rightful place, which is not as deferential as they currently are to this uh, institution. Maybe we've had that rock bottom moment. Maybe we've had it. Which is which is what though? The is the insurrection, huh? Well, it, uh, no, I, I would say it's um, the uh, the withdrawal from, I, I think the, the more, uh, you know, for purposes of this conversation, it's the withdrawal from Afghanistan and the uh, deaths at Kabul, uh, particularly the drone strike. I, I think that may be the sort of galvanizing uh, iconic event. If it's recognized as such, the fact is we have so many other things on our plate right now as a country and as a political system that that could get pushed out of the limelight, but it, belong, it deserves to be in the limelight. And that's why the Scheller case is so fascinating. And I, I don't think we've heard the last, we certainly haven't heard the last from Colonel Scheller. There'll be others too. Yeah. It's not, it's not over. Interesting, uh, Brenna, that you say that. I think that's a very thoughtful uh, notion. And, and in fact, there are some people who feel that the problem in Congress, the problem in our democracy and our government is not going to get resolved until we hit rock bottom. And rock bottom may be a war. Rock bottom may be uh, climate change, extreme storms and calamities and casualties and 
you know, that make people turn around and say, whoa, we better get back to basics. Um, Gene says no. no. Um, rock, rock bottom has to do with the filibuster and whether we can pass uh, a Voting Rights Act in the, in the 21st century. If we can't, uh, I mean, good grief. That's, that's, about, well, that's about rock bottom, I think. In this well, point. we may be uh, okay, Carl. We're almost out of time. I want to offer you the opportunity of trying to come up with a, sort of a summarization and profundity here. <laughs> okay, uh, well, I think we need to remember that the the civil military relationship in the United States has to involve all three elements: the civilian government, the military, and the public, and we have to figure out how to hold each one accountable for what it's responsible for. And I think that that is, is a fundamental task that is going to have to be done, but it has to be done collaboratively. And I think therein is, is my conundrum, is how do you actually do that with the dysfunctional legislative branch that we have? And so I think that it has to be a, a social movement of some kind. Mm -hmm. that there has to be some recognition that the legislative branch is a problem for the American people. And I think that's the, the one takeaway that I would like to get from this. Here, here. Uh, Carl, thank you. Um, uh, Carl Baker has been with um, you know, uh, the, the issues of foreign policy, uh, foreign, um, you know, foreign relations for a career um, with uh, CSIS and Pacific Forum here in Honolulu. <laughs> Let me ask you a, a, for a closing remark. <clears throat> uh, and um, uh, Brenna, something uh, profound, if you don't mind, to leave people with? Uh, I think, uh, I think uh, basically, I agree with Gene now that I've thought about it. I think there was an op-ed in the Times a, a few weeks ago uh, reflecting on the failures uh, that Gene noted and where the, the op-ed basically said, the downs, it, think about the downsides of trusting in the military. We've trusted in the military for so long. And I think that was really a courageous op-ed, but also it was indicative of a change. And um, maybe we are uh, in a new era now after, after this last, this fall. And uh, we'll, we'll have to see. We'll have to see, we'll have to get together again. Uh, Brenner, who is uh, teaching at Hofstra in the subject, uh, collaborating with Gene, I think. Uh, and also spent some time uh, with the Court of Appeals for uh, Armed Forces. Uh, and Jean, you know, the teaching at NYU in military justice, teaching military justice for since 1922, it's really remarkable. Um, and uh, and <laughs> being involved- I mean, how, well, how well preserved I am. <laughs> yes, it's, a, it's amazing the way that works. <laughs> and maybe it helps. Uh, and, you know, and, uh, and being in the practice of military justice for a long, long time, uh, I want to ask you to summarize and give your profound, um, you know, message to our viewers. It's on President Biden. I, I think he is the central character in the drama that's unfolding. It's not, it, it's not Mitch McConnell. It's not, um, you know, Josh Hawley. Uh, it's not Colonel Scheller. It's President Biden. And uh, I, I, I believe he can do it, but he's gonna have to uh, be uh, more, not forthright, but more full-throated uh, and impress upon the people the gravity of the challenges that we're facing. Uh, he's, he's done an okay job in terms of the pandemic. He didn't inv invent the pandemic uh that we've rocked along it's been an uncertain path but i think that the political and structural issues that the country is currently facing that our federal government our federal system is currently facing are so profound and uh, congress which he knows very very well is so broken that actually there's only one person in the united states that can uh begin the task of fixing it and that's the president of the united states he's got a bully pulpit god bless him i hope he uses it yeah and what i take from all of this is god bless us and save us all 
<laughs> uh, Gene Fidel, uh, Predator Fistel, and Carl Baker. Thank you so much, gentlemen. Mahalo. Thanks, Jay. Hello.